All right, I'm going uh, to pull up another one of these. Um, so these are guides on how to choose your audio interface. This is the question that comes up way more than anything else for me. So, you know, it's, it's important to actually take a look at these. Uh, and, of course, as soon as I start going, here comes the phone. All right, sorry for that. I know that's uh, as soon as I, as soon as I do anything, that that phone's gonna ring. That, that's you know, that's just how it is, right? So, okay, so this is Sweetwater's version. Uh, it's uh, from March 28, twenty twenty, and um, I think this is their newest one. So let me play this one. Let's let's see what we get. Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher from Sweetwater. Today let's take a look at how to choose the best USB audio interface for your needs. There are many, many different USB audio interfaces available. Okay, so um, looks like this one is specifically USB, which is fine because that's probably going to be most of everybody. Uh, so that's probably okay, but so just keep that in mind. So when you guys are saying Thunderbolt or whatever, uh, let's, let's see what they got here. Available, and there's a lot to consider when you're trying to choose the best one for what you're doing. In this video, we'll be talking about the features that are important, things you need to consider as you're making your selection, and we'll also take a look at some great examples of USB audio interfaces at a wide range of prices that offer a wide range of features as well. So let's begin by talking about how to choose an audio interface. The big question that you want to ask yourself right up front is, what am I doing? How will I be using this audio interface? Is it just me recording an acoustic guitar at home? Am I trying to record a complete band? Do I need to be able to take the audio interface out on location when I'm recording? So you need to look at your applications and how you'll be using the interface to even get an idea of where to start. Now once you know your applications for the audio interface, then you can start narrowing your choices down. The first place to start is with the I.O., the inputs and the outputs. You want to look at how many inputs and outputs you need, the types of inputs and outputs, and so on. You'll also want to consider all the different features that audio interfaces offer. This could range from everything from special types of connections to onboard DSP to other features as well. If you are going to be working with a mobile situation, you'll want to consider the size and weight, and it's also important to consider the physical format of your audio interface. Will it sit on your desktop in front of you, or will it mount in a rack off to the side? And of course, if you know, this is surprisingly comprehensive for Sweetwater. Um, not that their videos are bad, but I mean, this is really hitting a lot of the important points. I'm, I'm, I'm so cynical of stuff. I, I was expecting a lot of dumb by now. We're a minute and 27 seconds in. But, you know, considering your, your inputs and outputs, some of you guys need SPDIF stuff or AES or Word Clock or, or whatever. Um, it is important. And, and again, like, like he said, uh, okay. So if you look at most of the like eight channel mic preamp type, interfaces or even just the eight channel mic preamps they got a lot of them have the um two inputs on the front and the other six on the back and for some people that's real handy if you have all your stuff in a rack it may or may not be like you might you know in my case i had to like drill some holes in a in a case so that i could run the uh six channels of for three different mic preamps to run the things into the front but you know it can be handy to have them on the front it's just 
uh, something to, to think about. So he's, he's actually pretty correct about that. The very important consideration is price. We have audio interfaces that range from below $100 to up to several thousand dollars. And you'll want to understand the differences and how those can help you out in your studio when you're making your choice. A couple of other things to think about before we get into more specifics on the features. First of all, how important are specs? Do they really matter? I mean, we can compare these audio interfaces and you'll find that, for example, maybe the distortion levels are within a couple of thousandths of a percent. Is that really audible? I'd encourage you to take all those specs into consideration, but not to place a ton of weight on them. What's more important is that you have the proper I.O., the proper features, the proper format, and that it's coming in at a price that works for you. Okay, so... Uh, you know, I've had issues with Sweetwater before, but this took some serious balls because, you know, like, uh, you know, I, I was actually one of the few people who will actually take this gear and measure it and, and actually see just, uh, just how close the, uh, these things get. So for instance... <laughs> Um, if you go to this page, I, I'm, I'm actually comparing. Uh, let's let's do something else. Let's do uh, mic preamps. Mic preamps. Um, I'm actually comparing some super high end mic preamps with some of the interface mic preamps, and, and the truth is, for the most part, they're very close. I mean, there are some crappy ones, but in general, they are very, very close to each other. And here's Sweetwater saying, you know, the specs. Don't worry about the specs so much. I mean, I, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but these things are so close together uh, for anything good that you're, you're just specs is not going to you're not going to get something that's so distorted that you can't use it or so noisy you can't use it really. Any of the any of the better stuff. Uh, I mean, I'm talking like when you reach the 40 or 50 dollars per mic pre level on an interface. <laughs> It's um, it's so good now that you just look at this stuff. It's just so good that you're not you're really not going to worry about it. Uh, so it it was you know is, does the form factor fit? Does it have the um, as much I/O as you need? That which is really important. Can you expand it if you need more I/O? Um, that's the important stuff. The the specs are not. And no matter what you read on for on forums, they're all going to talk about how how horrible this particular piece of gear is and how great this other one is when they have pretty much exactly the same specs. He just went out and said it, you know, don't worry about the specs so much as, as your other issues. And I'm going to put drivers above everything else, uh, assuming you don't have some really piece of crap specs, which, which you're not going to have on good drivers anyway. Another topic that always comes up when you're talking about audio interfaces is latency. Yeah. And latency well, is the time that it takes for a signal to enter the audio interface, to go through the computer, come back to the audio interface, and then be sent out to the monitors or to your headphones. If there's too much latency or even an audible delay when you're listening to your signals, it'll make it difficult to overdub tracks. Now with all the audio interfaces we're looking at today, there are different systems in place to help you minimize latency or to remove it entirely. Some of these are DSP based, some of them are hardware monitoring, some of them are analog, some of them are digital. That really doesn't matter, the function is the same. The idea is to get that latency down to where it's really not noticeable as a performer. And all of these interfaces do that very well. Let's take a- Okay, let's, let's talk about this for a second. So first of all, um, Again, I've actually gone through and measured these things, and with the help of uh, mostly Reaper users around the world. Here's the actual round-trip latency of most of the driver families. Uh, something that you're going to notice, when, when you're talking USB, there's just RME. I mean, again, like I hate to always be tooting the RME horn, but RME is going to beat the crap out of everything else. It just always is. Uh, not only is it going to have lower round-trip latency... But at any given buffer size, it's going to be a lot less likely to crash. It's going to be a lot less munchy. And if you were actually to type in DAW bench uh, and look at what they do when they test a low latency performance, like how many plugins can you actually run um, at a time? Uh, they use like Reex comps and stuff. Uh, the better drivers can run more plugins before they start crackling and stuff. And, and every time it's going to be RME, 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 RME is always going to be the top. So when you're talking USB, unfortunately, 
uh, when you look at the numbers, you'll you'll see that there's there's some super crap ones, and then there's some middle of the road stuff. And the middle of the road stuff is generally made by a company called Thessicon. At least that's how the uh, Dobbench guys say it. I used to say the Psycon, but I think I was wrong. Um, they make the drivers for just about everybody that you can think of. And in, in, in when you watch these forum debates and you guys are just, I mean, they crack me up because the guy's like, oh, that one's got a piece of crap drivers and this one's got good drivers. It turns out the drivers are the same. You know, so the SSL and Audient and the Behringer all use those same drivers. So uh, that's the middle of the road. There are some like in between there. I think I think Yamaha, uh, Steinberg, the UR series interfaces, and the Zoom UAC2. I think those had slightly faster USB than the Thessicon drivers. Uh, but still not as good as the RME stuff. So that that's where you're talking drivers. Now, when he says that there's a way to uh, the, the DSP monitoring, so that there's there's different ways to do your to lower your round trip latency. If you want to hear what you're actually recording, you know, with with your with your plugins, with your rest of the band and everything, with the mix that you've got up in your DAW, uh, you know, you're really you're really talking about your actual round trip latency. You're really talking about running through the computer, like you said, through the plugins, back to the, back out the computer, back into your interface. Um, you know, early on in the Reaper days, we made sure that you had ASIO direct monitoring and all this stuff because you really did need that that quicker monitoring. The computers just weren't capable, and you know we thought we needed near zero latency, and so. You know, there are these DSP solutions, but remember, when you do that kind of thing, you do need to keep two mixes in mind. You need to do the DSP mixer, and you also need to do your DAW mixer, and, and it can just be a, <clears throat> a juggle that you don't want to do. You may want to. You might want to use the onboard effects and things like that. To me, it's just more of a hassle than it's worth, um, and like I've said many times, usually for most artists that I've ever run into, if you can get the round trip latency under 13 milliseconds, they're usually fine. So uh, that's a lot of stuff to, to talk about, but, but something to keep in mind when we're talking about round trip latency and talking about DSP monitoring, which, you know, RME actually has a really good DSP monitor. They had the ultimate one, uh, but there's others. But like I say, don't use it. <laughs> so here we go. A deeper look at some of the features you'll want to consider as you're looking at choosing an audio interface. The first of these that I like to look at is compatibility. What platforms does the interface support? We have Macintosh, PC Windows, iOS, Android, and you'll want to ensure that the interface you choose supports your chosen platform. Now, many of these interfaces support more than one platform. They all should do at least Windows and Mac. They, they may do the other, the mobile platforms and stuff, but you, you do run into stuff, especially when you get to the higher end, uh, allegedly higher end gear. You don't have this problem with RME, but, um, you know, with the UA stuff and I hear with the Antelope stuff, that you may um, you might have trouble on on Windows or you might have trouble on Mac. I think it's still the case that you can actually get a faster, uh, lower round trip latency on Windows than Mac. I'm not positive, so that's that's to keep in mind that if you really want the ultimate in performance, you're going to want to use Windows with most of this stuff. You might have Mac and PC and say iOS compatibility with one interface, but just make sure you're getting one that works with your computer or device. Next up, ensure that you have the proper connection format. There are actually several types of USB in use today, USB 2, USB 3, USB-C, and many interfaces will support more than one of those or be backward compatible with different versions of USB, but just make sure that the interface you choose will again work with your platform. Once you have compatibility and connectivity with your platform sorted, you'll want to take a look at some of the physical characteristics of the audio interface. Let's begin by talking about the number of inputs you need. In many cases, you might need only one input. If you're just recording a single voice or an acoustic guitar that's plugging directly in or something like that, one input may cover what you need. But in most cases, you'll need at least two, so you could record a guitar and a voice at the same time or a stereo instrument if you like. If you're working with a band or more than one instrument at the same time, you want to have enough inputs to cover all of those sources simultaneously. 
These interfaces range from two inputs up to eight inputs, and there are interfaces that offer even more inputs than that. Once you have the number of inputs figured out, you'll want to look at the types of inputs you need. And there are three analog... Sorry, I'm going to mute this again. Okay. Swing ops have extended warranty covers today. And you may be eligible for a three hundred dollar insta reboot. So I gotta ask you something. Uh do you know how many miles on that vehicle now? Uh, estimate a hundred thousand. A hundred thousand. Yeah. Oh, that's right. Uh just the characteristics of the audio interface. Noise. Let's begin by talking about the number of inputs you need. Yep. Okay, if you go for a few moment, I will introduce my Honda especially. It will provide more information in all the benefits uh, that we have available today for you. All right, we got uh, a scammer on the line, so, so sorry for the diversion, but this is always going to be fun. Like, I can take it from here. Okay. Uh, yep. Good afternoon, sir. This is Mike. I'll be helping you from here. How you doing? Okay. Okay. Good, good, good. Awesome. We're going to take a look at some options for the extended coverage on the 2015 Honda Civic. Okay. If we can get you approved, if we can work everything out, yeah, uh, there is a three hundred dollar instant rebate we can apply. Okay. Why? Why do you guys? Right now. Why? Why do you guys think I have a twenty fifteen Honda Civic? I'm just going off of what your file says here, sir. What where, do you have? Where'd you get this file? Where Where did you get this file? What the hell? Yeah, these scammers are dumb, man. Okay, it's just like anything else. You're, you're, yeah, you know, this is why we do these interface guides because they're they're always trying to uh, always trying to separate you from your money. You know, uh, you're getting the wrong thing. Anyways, okay, so let's uh, let's 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 keep going here. Jesus. Um, let me uh, just. A hundred thousand. <laughs> There's always some scam, but you know these are the same kind of like you see in, in Facebook. It's constant scams about how to promote your music or whatever. Uh, okay, so let's just keep going. Okay, so he's about to make an actually important point. Log types that you'll want to consider. The first are instrument level inputs, which would support direct connection of a guitar or a bass. Second, we have mic level connections, and these of course are used for microphones, whether dynamic microphones, condenser microphones, you'll want to ensure you have 48 volt phantom power if you're using condenser microphones. And finally, we have line level inputs. Okay. So here, here is uh, pretty important. Um, most of people who are, you know, let's, let's be honest with yourself about what you're going to do most of the time. If, if you're mostly going to be singing and playing guitar, electric guitar or bass or whatever. Um, you want to have one of these, these, these things that everybody makes fun of where it's an XLR with a combo input so that you can plug a quarter inch in the middle and then you have a button to turn on an instrument input. It's like having a DI. I, I get yelled at for calling these DIs. To me, it does the exact same function as a DI, so I don't care. Call it an instrument input, whatever. It's very convenient to have this thing. Some of the older focus right interfaces and i think some other interfaces still couldn't handle that high of a level so if you had like really loud pickups you, you might have clipped no matter what you did on these interfaces but i think that's mostly taken care of now but it, it's just really handy for for the vast majority of people who are you know they're not recording drums all day long it's just really handy to have a mic preamp and an instrument in, in input right there uh now the line input's an interesting thing because for the you know the purists out there for you know guys like me where we want to make sure that we got the shortest possible signal path and everything, it's nice to have an actual line input that you can plug like another mic preamp into or whatever. But in practice, one of the craziest things again, which we've measured, and this goes against all of the religious stuff I was taught early on in pro audio. Uh, Plugging into one of these newer mic preamps really doesn't make the type of trouble that you'd expect. 
instead of a line input. Uh, I'm sure it could be audible, but for the most part, you're really not going to hear it. But, you know, honestly, if, if you're worried about whether or not you have line inputs, you probably are, have a lot, interface with more line inputs on it anyway. But it's something to, to keep uh, to think about. Often these are balanced connections, and they can be used for connecting keyboards and external audio hardware. You'll also want to look at the number of outputs that you need. In some cases, you may just need a stereo pair of outputs to drive your monitors. But if you want to incorporate external hardware, you may need additional line level outputs, and you'll also want to consider headphone outputs. Begin by looking at the number of monitor outputs. And these may be dedicated, or they may be simply line level outputs that are being used for monitors. In any for, for most people, the single stereo pair of outputs is going to be just fine. Uh, of course, you know, not that I'm going to derail this with the same thing that I always talk about, and that's moving audio from one application to another. Uh, having more outputs might give you some loopback capabilities, but for most people, just that stereo out is going to be fine. It You know, that's generally all I use, but actually at the school, I'm, I'm using a couple different outputs. I, I have the capability for, you know, 30 outputs or whatever, but... I really generally give the band my mix. Uh, if I really need to make special separate mixes, I can. But for the most part, you're probably going to be okay with two unless unless you're beyond watching this kind of guide anyway, I think. In any case, you'll want to have a volume control that allows you to set the level of those monitors. You'll want at least one stereo pair, and if you're switching between two different sets of monitors, you'll need four outputs. You'll also want to look oh, at this is something really cool. Some interfaces have a have a volume for your monitor outputs, which would be like your speaker outputs in your control in your control room. And then they have a separate volume for your headphones, which is really cool. It's very convenient. Good headphone outputs when you're monitoring. And there are several different aspects to this. As the engineer, you'll want to be able to connect a set of headphones so you can really do a detailed listen to what's happening. But you'll also want headphone outputs that you can feed to your musicians. And the question then becomes, does the audio interface offer a separate independent mix that you could route to the musicians that's different than what you're hearing as the engineer? Well, so now, what are we talking about here? Are we talking about the DSP monitoring? Because these things really do have comprehensive, I mean, lots of them have their own, like, mixing software inside for giving everybody different mixes. But to me, again, like I said, I would rather monitor through the DAW and turn off all the direct monitoring anyway. If you're not doing a lot of work with other musicians, then additional headphone outputs may not be an issue for you. One may be plenty. But if you are working with other musicians, you'll definitely want to look at the number of headphone outputs as well as the number of separate headphone mixes you can have. The final type of output to consider is line level outputs. And again, these are used for incorporating external hardware, whether you're feeding an external mixer, whether you're routing signal out of the interface into, say, a hardware compressor and then bringing it back in during mix down. Uh, you know, we use the line level in outputs here to get to um, headphone amps that are in different rooms. Whatever you might be doing, it's useful to have separate line outputs from your monitor outputs. Some audio interfaces also offer built-in MIDI I.O., MIDI input and output, and this is used for connecting an external keyboard or other MIDI gear. If you're working with that type of gear, having that built into the interface is very useful. Yeah, you know... Uh, we do a lot of testing with the Behringer FCB 1010s, things like that. Uh, it is awesome to have an interface that actually has MIDI I.O. That's really cool. I know most of everything is doing MIDI over USB now. And like over here, we have a wireless, uh, goes to a CME wireless USB thing. But uh, it's, it's nice to have MIDI on board. We talked earlier about analog input and output on your audio interface, and this is, of course, going to be primary for connecting your instruments and microphones and so on. But it's also useful to have digital I.O. on your audio interface. This can be used for bringing in additional microphone preamps, can be used for connecting external gear, an external digital mixer, whatever it might be. Having a digital connection, whether an input, an output, or both, can allow you to easily expand your audio interface later. There are two primary formats to consider with audio interfaces. The first is ADAT, which is an optical format that carries eight channels of information simultaneously. It always blows me away that the ADAT interface, the ADAT format, uh, how old? It's like 30-something years old now. Nobody uses ADATs anymore, but we still use these. I've got, I use ADAT, uh, all of my mic preamps have ADAT out. My RME, my main uh, audio interface in here, uh, RME Digiface USB has four sets of ADAT I.O. for 32 ins and outs. Um, 
In the other rooms, we have Motu 2408s, which have three sets of ADAT IOs for 24 ins and outs. Uh, it's just a, it's an amazing format. But make sure that you understand how exactly you're going to be clocking this stuff. This this is where it can get a little bit ugly. Um, if your ADAT gear that you're feeding into your interface has an ADAT input, you can probably do ADAT sync across everything. In, in my case, I have a lot of Focusrite, uh, the older Octoprees that didn't have a um, an actual word clock out. They just had word clock in and you can't turn the termination off. So you have to actually use distribution units and all kinds of craziness. So make sure you understand how you need to get your sync. And uh, if you have any sync questions, um, just let me know. I, I can I can probably answer them. You know, maybe one of these days I'll I'll, I'll do a whole thing on sync. But um, in general, uh, just let me know of your sync concerns. The second is SPDIF. This is a two-channel stereo format that's carried either over an optical cable or a coaxial cable with an RCA connector. You may also encounter the AES format, which uses XLR type connectors for two channels. If you are using a lot of digital connections in your system, or you have more than one piece of digital gear that you're connecting simultaneously... Oh man, I don't even want to... Okay. Hopefully we're not about to get into clock magic claims. The, the truth is... All right. I'm going to make this claim. If you have a working word clock generator, I don't care what it is. It could be a piece of crap. It could be a million dollar thing that claims all these magical terms about uh, unquantifiable things about your sound that it can do this magical stuff that they don't back up in any way, shape, or form. You know, over here we use a aardvark thing. It's probably 30 years old. Ancient, ancient clock device. Uh, if you go to read papers on Dan Lavery, who I would, you know, I would call the, the source on digital audio when it comes to the converters and clocks and things, he's going to say that no matter what, your an external clock will never improve your your circuit you you have to have an external clock in order to in order to use more than one digital audio device and that's just how it is don't expect that it's going to make your sound better or whatever it's not going to make your sound worse i mean I've, I've never seen it i'd love for somebody to show us in a non-pathological example where you know again like i'm using this 30 year old clock because now you got a bunch of scammers out there selling you what used to cost $60 for a clock or $100 or whatever, they're selling for thousands of dollars and claiming all kinds of stuff about that their clocks can do these magical things to your sound. It is just horrible nonsense, and it's really hard to get clocks anymore. So, yeah, I have to buy these ancient clocks and hope that they work. i got to get them off of eBay or whatever. Um, hopefully, if you're looking at the picture right here that, that uh, they're showing, this particular unit has a has a terminator that you can turn on or off. So it's got a word word clock uh, on, word out through seventy five ter uh, ohm terminator on or off. Hopefully, any device you got, if it's got a word clock in, you can turn on or turn off a terminator. And um, if you can't turn off the terminator, you know you can use a T thing and uh well actually if you can't turn off the terminator you're screwed um you have to use a, a clock distribution system which is again something we got over here i actually have two of them <clears throat> because of this nonsense so yeah there you go um this is really cool this whatever unit this is i think this is a tascam interface uh it has has a switchable termination so hopefully whatever you got has word clock in and out. The newer focus rights, the ones I don't have uh, on the at least for the for the eight out out only ones, have word clock in and out. So you don't have to worry about this nonsense anymore. Um, anyway, so let's go on here. A word clock input and output can allow making those connections easier and also ensure that you have a stable clock throughout your system. Finally, you'll want to look at special features that might be important for what you're doing in your particular... Okay, so that was cool. He didn't try and sell you some billion-dollar nonsense clock. I, I was ready for it because they do... Uh, let's let's take a look. <laughs> so I'm going to go to Sweetwater's site here. Um, let's look at word clock. I, I just want to show you how ridiculous this stuff gets. Word clock. Uh, so there's the Black Lion Micro Mark III XB Master Clock. Remember, this is just a word clock, uh, so it's a thousand bucks. Let's uh, let's take a look at what it's got. Thousand um, dollars. 
and it has oh, it has six clock outs. That's kind of cool. Spit if out, optical out. So, you know, a thousand bucks, you get six outs. You know, back in the day, you got to pay a hundred bucks, you get six outs. But whatever. Uh, let's see. Uh, black line through painstaking engineering. Black line reduced the jitter by two thirds. Inspect their flagship clock with super accurate crystal oscillators and high caliber galvanic isolation, both of which contribute to the exemplary jitter performance. Um, again, I, I want to see somebody show me an example where jitters ruined anything on a, on a non-pathological signal. Uh, jitter can induce phase discrepancies and distortion into your digital signals, resulting in harshness and blurring, especially in the high frequencies. That's the prime reason Sweetwater engineers are so picky about the clocking we use in our studios. Uh, anyway, so, it, you know, they didn't really, so they just talked about harshness and blurring, but they didn't get too crazy. Um, yeah, anyway, so that's a thousand bucks for six hour outlets. So this is something to keep an eye about. If you have a device where you have to do word clock in and you have to uh, split the word clock because the terminators are making trouble, you're going to spend another thousand dollars. Doesn't give you anything better for your audio. Doesn't give you more channels. Nothing else. Another thousand bucks to think about. OK, uh, here's a Mutech. Uh, Another one, USB Master Clock, $1,300. Avid Sync HD, $2,000. Uh, let's see, the Black Lion Audio Micro. So there's a, there's a cheaper Black Lion. It's only $300. And I think, what, you get you get two or three outputs on this one? <clears throat> you get, yeah, I don't know. You get you get more. I think you get three outputs for 300 bucks. I mean, it's not as bad, but still, yet. Yeah, I mean, come on, it's just a clock... Tascam, $2,199. So basically $2,200 for um, 12 word clock outputs. Uh, I mean, it's just ridiculous. And then th there's a company, I say RME. Okay, so the guys who aren't going to rip you off, uh, you know, $179 for their word clock add-on for whatever their thing is. But um, I think it comes with some of their cards anyway. But th there are some absolute howlers when it comes to word clock. I'm not actually seeing this, which is, uh, I've, I've kind of, there used to be, I swear there was an antelope one, and it was like crazy money. I don't see it on, on Sweetwater anymore. That's interesting. Let me see. Antelope clock. Because they made some claims. Uh, we're not a dealer for antelope audio at this time. Nice. Uh, okay. I, I, am I not supposed to say that? Uh, Antelope made some claims about their clock. Well, let me just, I know I'm going off on a major tangent, but I'm sorry. This is, this is important to me. It's important that, that people understand, you know, what's, what they have to pay for and what they really don't. Ooh, they've discontinued. Um, interesting. So let's see. Audio interfaces, master clocks. Okay. Isotone, isochrone, trinity. Okay, so here we go. It's only three thousand dollars for this clock. Let's see. Um, the best sounding master clock. I would love to get a bunch of guys in a room and an ABX test between this clock and another clock. The best sounding. Okay, so let's see what it says. Uh, what what makes it the best sounding? To me, if you're if you're not adding or subtracting from the frequency response if, if you're ruler flat if you're not limiting the bandwidth if you're not adding distortion if you're not adding noise that's as good as it gets i don't i don't think you can always say that plus three decibels at 14k always sounds better i don't think so so what does that mean best sounding uh, a new level of detail focused clock acoustically focused clocking uh but, you know, actually, this I swear there was some, like, crazy weasel words before on here, but this is actually looking decent. Eh, you know, I'm going to stop getting off. I'm going to get off this tangent, sorry. I just get, I get real sketchy in the subject of clocks. 
So let's go back to this. Particular applications. One example is a reamp output that allows you to send a guitar level signal back out so you can either run the signal into a guitar amplifier or route it into guitar pedals and then bring that back in when you're mixing. There are other special features as well, and you'll see those as we're looking at some of these different audio interfaces. Well, what interface has a reamp out? That's actually pretty interesting. Sounds cool. <clears throat> Especially for you guys that are doing a lot of amp modeling and stuff, that would be really kind of cool. Some audio interfaces also offer onboard DSP or digital signal processing chips. Now these chips allow for latency-free monitoring using a built-in mixer, and they can also allow you to run proprietary plugins and special processing effects. Okay, so for the pedants out there, yes, there is converter latency. So it's not exactly zero latency mixing, but it's going to be a lot, or zero latency monitoring. But it's going to be all, it's going to be less than uh, going through the computer and going through the converters. So inside the audio interface without loading down your computer. But again, I, I wouldn't use this stuff. I would just monitor through the computer. And I, I'm really skeptical about the onboard DSP for the most part. I mean, some of it's handy. I actually like some of the Motu stuff, but I don't really end up using it except for maybe live. Uh, you know, this brings up a lot of gotchas when you start using the, the hardware DSP. And the main one that people think of is universal audio. And, and I think you know I don't tend to like those units that much anyway. If you're working mobile, you'll want to look for an audio interface that can be bus powered, which means that it's powered using the USB cable. You don't need a separate power supply. Much and it's important to think about, I'm sorry I keep stopping this, but um, when it comes to bus powered stuff, there's a lot of claims out there that you're just not able to get enough uh, electrical power, voltage or current or whatever to really power mic preamps properly and uh i think that there's a couple out there like maybe the cad the, the ones people really like the m179 i've heard people say that the phantom power available on bus powered interfaces won't power mics like that i i've never actually seen a condenser mic not be powered by a bus powered interface but i i, I can i can believe that that could be a case it's more convenient when you're on the go I also recommend you look at the bundled software that comes with the audio interface when you're making your choice. This could I don't care. It's nice to get some free plugins or whatever, but whatever DAW they're going to give you is going to be some light version that it's going to be a joke anyway. Just just go buy Reaper. Include things like a entry level DAW to get you started recording. It might include plugins for processing signals, loops, samples, and so on. Some of these come with very large bundles of software that can be very useful. Now, typically, you're also going to pair this with a DAW that you use every day along with it, but having software that comes with the interface will get you started right out of the box. Now that we've talked about some of the factors and considerations when you're choosing an audio interface, let's look at some specific examples of popular audio interfaces. I've got 13 different audio interfaces for us to consider today, and I've tried to put together a selection of interfaces that are both very popular and that offer a wide range of different features and that come in at a wide range of prices. We'll look at these in order of ascending price. So we'll begin with our most affordably priced audio interface, the Presonus AudioBox USB 96. Now this is a Mac and PC compatible audio interface. It's a desktop format, so it'll sit right in front of you on the desktop, bus powered, you don't need a power supply. And it offers two simultaneous inputs, two simultaneous outputs. It has two preamps, and it also has MIDI I.O. The Audion Evo 4 offers Mac and PC compatibility. Uh, you know, I love the feature sets of these PreSonus things, you know, we've had our back and forths over the years. Um, I have a central station in here right now. I'm not actually using it, but out in the big room, we have another central station. That one is in use. And uh, I do worry about PreSonus obsoleting their, their drivers from time to time. So that's to be aware of. But, but you know, now that we're past the Dice 2 era, and I probably shouldn't even really bring this up anymore because, you know, we are long past that era. But... Um, the PreSonus stuff generally works pretty damn well. They always seem to be locked in a, in a death match with Focusrite. Um, I trust Focusrite's drivers a little bit more because they do go out of their way to... Uh, they, they've even made their, their first generation uh, Scarlet series. Uh, they've released some newer drivers for that. It's almost like something RME would do. Ability. It's a desktop format audio interface that can be bus powered offers two simultaneous inputs, two outputs, two preamps, and it has a very cool smart gain automatic level setting feature. It also offers a loopback function that's great for podcasting and live streaming. All right, now that's cool. So, okay, 
this is the subject of so many other videos that I made. You can go and watch those. But loopback is really awesome to have. I mean, it'd be nice to have more than one channel loopback. It'd be nice to have a lot of virtual loopback channels available, not have to give up <clears throat> your your audio I.O. But um, when it does come to that audience stuff, uh, watch watch out for the hype because we do see a lot of people will make all these claims about the audience stuff sounding so much better and being so much better than the other stuff. Turns out they use the same drivers as Behringer does. Um, the company's pretty responsive when, when I've had to talk to them, which is cool. But um, the, people make these claims that it sounds so much better than, than the rest of the stuff, and they never back it up. I always ask for measurements. Nobody ever gives me anything. So be aware, there's a lot of hype out there, and that's, that's something we're always trying to dispel around here. Next up, we have the third generation of the Focusrite Scarlett 2i2. This is a Mac and PC compatible audio interface in desktop format with bus powering. It offers two inputs and two outputs and has two Focusrite preamps with switchable air mode. Air mode allows you to emulate the sound of the high-end transformers in ISA microphone preamps. One of the newer audio interfaces on our list today is the Moto 2 M4. It's compatible with Mac, PC, and iOS. It's a desktop format audio interface, bus powered, and offers four inputs and four outputs with two preamps. It has built- now Here's the bummer. You know, it used to be that, that the, the big race was between RME and Motu when, when it came to PCI, when it came to Firewire. Those guys were always neck and neck uh, for, you know, round trip latency. The, the Motu USB drivers, I swear they're nothing special. Like I, I actually had an easier time dealing with the Focusrite USB drivers than the Motu USB drivers on my 896 Mark III. There was, there was, had a lot of trouble with uh, with just basic Windows settings, like getting reset all the time. I, I just I was surprised by how badly those Motu USB drivers are. And, and let me tell you, the, one of the reasons I'm so surprised is that in our big room, we have a Motu 2408 made in 1998. This is a digital device that's made in the, in the late 90s, and it is still running perfectly today uh the last drivers for it were made in 2015 i'm a little bit scared about that but that's how good motu used to make their stuff so it, it's surprising how crap the usb drivers are compar comparatively built-in midi io and offers a loopback function for podcasting and live streaming and so there you go you got you got loopback you got midi io that's a pretty comprehensive unit on that m4 the Solid State Logic SSL 2 Plus was one of the big hits at the recent Winter NAM show in Anaheim, California. It offers Mac and PC compatibility in a desktop format with bus powering. Okay, so check this out. So if you want something that says SSL on it, here you go. Uh, again, these have those Thessicon drivers as far as I know. So you're not really stepping up in the driver game. But, um, you know, it does say SSL on it. We have two inputs and four outputs, and there are two preamps with switchable 4K legacy mode. Now this allows you to emulate the sound of the very expensive high-end 4K mixing consoles from SSL. It also has built-in MIDI I.O. One of the great features of the Steinberg URRT2 audio interface is that it has Rupert Neve designed transformers that you can switch in and out of the signal path. This allows you to add that very desirable Neve coloration to your signals. Again, what, what is the coloration? Like, can, can somebody tell me? If you can hear it, you can measure it. So is this like a, a different frequency response, a distortion, phase distortion? What exactly is that? You know, like I'd love to ABX these things and, and see just how many people that make such a big deal about it can actually hear anything to do with this, you know. But um, I think that these Steinberg UR models use a different driver than the, uh, than the Thessicon drivers, I think. Last time I checked that these drivers were somewhere in between the RMEs and the and the standard Thessicon drivers. Let me see. I'm going to look on the round trip latency chart real quick. Steinberg UR22. Okay, this one didn't turn out so well. I'm not sure if that's right or not. Uh, I, I got to take another look. Sorry. Let me take a look. It's a Mac, PC, and iOS compatible audio interface with four inputs, two outputs, and two of Steinberg's D-Pre preamps. It offers MIDI I.O. as well as a loopback function for podcasting and live streaming. So loopback again, Moving to that's rack mounted awesome. USB audio interfaces, we have the Focusrite Scarlett 18i20. Now, here now this we is go. also a third generation audio stuff. interface from Focusrite. Mac and PC compatible, we have 18 simultaneous inputs, 20 simultaneous outputs. 
Okay, so eight of these are on ADAP. So this is the first one you really, that in this list where I think, where you can expand it with an eight channel ADAP mic preamp. And there's some caveats to there. And I think on my page at Pipeline Audio, there's an article about picking uh, those eight channel mic preamps. So you go take a look at, at what you would actually use with this. But now you're talking about a, um, you know, you're capable of re recording a drum set and everything else. You, you, I'd like to have a, a little bit more channels. I wish Focusrite would make something with two ADAT ports, but uh, so far they haven't. At least not in USB. There are eight preamps, and each of those has a switchable air mode that emulates ISA transformers. There's built-in MIDI I.O. as well as ADAT and SPDIF digital I.O. for expansion. We have a word clock output for synchronizing clocks with external gear, and there's a built-in onboard talkback mic for when you're operating a session with additional musicians. This interface also includes a virtual loopback function for... Oh, I didn't know that had a built-in talkback. That's actually very handy. That's cool. Uh, actually, that is awesome focus, right? Podcasting and live streaming. Presona Studio 8... And so that has loopback as well. And so here we go again. We got the, the one that's going to uh, pre Sonus that's going to compete with the, the 18i20. Let's see about this one. 1824C is compatible with Mac, PC, iOS, and Android. It has 18 inputs and 18 outputs with eight of pre Sonus's XMAX preamps. We have MIDI I.O. as well as ADAT and SPDIF digital I.O., a word clock output, and this interface offers DSP mixing with control room integration. The Tascam US20. Uh, I wonder if that actually has a loopback too, but. With the Spitify IO, you could you could do your own loopback if you're not using that. Again, you probably got to give up two channels, but uh, at least that's something. 20 by 20 is compatible with Mac, PC, and iOS. It offers 20 inputs and 20 outputs with eight preamps. This interface features MIDI IO as well as ADAT and SPDIF digital IO. It has word clock input and output for synchronization and onboard DSP that includes EQ, compression, and reverb. It can also function as a standalone mixer for live use with a digital patch bay, and you can also recall scenes that make it very easy to set this up for particular gigs. The Apogee Duo. Well, the Tascam seems pretty cool. Um, it seemed very full feature. Again, we're, we're looking, we don't know about loopback. When I did get a chance to try that unit, uh, it had some driver problems, but I have a feeling that that was the guy's laptop and not necessarily anything wrong with their drivers, but it was a little scary. Um, but again, uh, you know, I had a studio where we had D88s and uh, DA38s and, you know, Tascam, as much as they get the prosumer badge and stuff, they have always innovated. I mean, they've really done a good job over the years and that interface, I, I just wish they hung harder in the, in the interface market, because that's probably a, a good interface. It, you know, somebody could probably talk to them and really get. If they wanted to listen, I, I think they could really take over this market. They should be able to. Duet makes a great portable audio interface. It's compatible with Mac, PC, and iOS, and has a desktop format. We have two inputs and four outputs with two preamps. There are also configurable touchpads on the front panel. The Apollo Twin Duet. Right, so a couple of these things. I, I would not recommend the Apogee stuff at all. There, there, was, there were several weird things about them. I don't think the drivers were ever all that trustworthy i think uh dawbench was actually saying they're using the thesicon stuff they're sitting there riding on the apogee name but um i think you're getting a pretty much a subpar interface i do like the form factor where it's kind of a flat thing with the knob on the top i think audient does that and a couple other companies as well the ssl definitely does and this one that we're showing here is the universal audio again i know that you know people who just read magazines and don't do this stuff for a living we'll rave all day long about the ua stuff but i uh i tend to stay away from this i don't think the dsp is really worth anything i, I really i know that's a strong thing to say but i i it's it doesn't add anything to me to the equation i used to have the ua stuff um i would stay away from this stuff honestly uh ua you're free to try and change my mind we could talk if you want duo usb from universal audio is compatible with pc it's a desktop format USB audio interface that offers 10 inputs and six outputs. One of the great features are the two Unison mic preamps. These allow you to load in emulations of vintage and classic yeah, microphone okay. preamps I'm and SPDIF the is the onboard a bundle of UAD plugins to get you started. For its compact size, the RME Babyface Pro FS offers a ton of features. It's Mac, PC, and iOS compatible in a desktop format with bus powering. 
We have 12 simultaneous inputs, 12 simultaneous outputs, and two onboard preamps. This interface also includes MIDI I.O. as well as ADAT or SPDIF digital I.O. For premium audio quality, the base... So, you know, now we're talking about RME. And it's a bummer that RME doesn't make like a... Um, I mean, they kind of do with the Fireface, but their stuff is expensive, you know. So I, I just use the, the Digiface. That's seriously 500 bucks for this little block with, with four ADAT ins and outs. I just use it as the interface. I don't even think I use the um, the, the headphone out on that thing. Um, but if you want to buy one of these RMEs that, that actually has its own converters on board or whatever, oh, they get expensive, man. Uh, the, but the baby face, I think it's just got two mic preamps, but it does have eight at I.O., uh, one channel of it. So, you know, eight channels of, of I.O. <coughs> so 12 in, 12 out. But again, eight of that is on eight at. Babyface Pro FS includes RME's proprietary Steady Clock FS, which is an ultra stable digital clock. It also has onboard DSP that provides EQ, reverb, echo, and latency free mixing. This just keeps going, man. Sorry, let me, uh, let me take this real quick. Sorry about that, but that was a very pleasant customer. So that's, it's always nice to have one of those. Sheesh. Last, but certainly not least, I want you to check out this Cranborn CA500 R8. This actually starts out as an eight slot 500 series rack. Okay, so this is cool. I saw this on Glenn Fricker's show. This guy, um, I'm not up for the 500 hype, the 500 fad, the 500 fetish, whatever that is, but this one is a, uh, it's a, it converts 500 stuff to um, ADAT IO. And, you know, they don't talk much about the converters. So, like, all these guys that claim all this witch doctory and magic and all this stuff, they seem to be just fine with, as long as it's in the 500, we don't care what the converters are. I'm sure they're fine. Uh, this thing looks really cool, but it's also an audio interface. So you you just built, mix, mix and match your own mic preamp, whatever, audio interface. That's cool. Uh I think it's Thessicon drivers. I'm not positive, but let's let's see what they say. You can load whatever modules you want into this, whether those are preamps, EQs, or different types of processors. You have a lot of flexibility here. But it also serves as a 28 input and 30 output USB audio interface with MIDI I.O. Yeah, so how does that work? 28 input and whatever output. Uh, that would suggest that it's got its own eight channels, and then it's got two more channels of ADAT. Uh which it does. Okay. So this is a pretty comprehensive piece right here. Um, it's got word clock. Let's see. So we got, I see word clock. It's got MIDI. It's got some kind of network stuff. I could be Dante. Uh, it says cast, whatever that is. Um, it's, it's pretty comprehensive looking. I don't know. So it has module direct outs. I have a feeling that's just the analog out straight from the input. Um, but it does have speaker outs, which I think are going to be your um, your uh, DAW outputs. So it's a pretty neat looking thing here. I, I mean, I'd consider it, but I, I'm not really interested in the 500 stuff. And ADAT and SPDIF digital I.O. We have word clock I.O. as well as a ton of routing flexibility. Now, because this is a 500 series rack and because it's modular in nature, it doesn't include preamps of its own. You choose the particular 500 series preamps that you want from the incredible range that are available and then mount those into the rack to get the flavors that you need when you're recording your tracks. And I still, like, I know people say flavor all day long and I just must be tone deaf because I really don't hear these flavors. I've, I've had, through my working life, I've had every mic preamp you can think of and I really don't hear these flavors. I must just suck, you know. I'm, I'm sure you guys can say whatever you want about me, but I just don't hear them. 
Uh, so, you know, I'm not all that interested in that stuff, but I'm sure, you know, most of you guys are. So go ahead. This thing will let you put in whatever mic preamps you want. Neve, API, Trident, SSL, whatever. I'm pretty sure SSL. The CA500R8 also includes analog summing, which allows you to mix your signals in the analog domain. Not even going to touch that with the 10-foot pole. We're going to move on from there. But I'm not going to get the bait. It has a dedicated talkback mic input. That is awesome. A full-featured monitor section for controlling your monitors and headphones, and it has a unique analog artist mixer function that allows you to create a separate mix for your artist when they're recording or overdubbing. If you need more inputs or more connectivity, multiple units can be cascaded together. And finally, we have cast ports on this that allow you to connect breakout boxes using Cat5 cables that make it very easy to route signals around your studio or if you're recording a live gig. As you can see, we have... I need to look up if cast is actually a like a studio format at this point. Many, many options when we're considering an audio interface. We've looked at just 13 interfaces today and this barely scratches the surface of the number that are available on the market. But even this selection of 13 interfaces covers a very broad range of prices and features. Which one's gonna be appropriate for you depends on your applications, the number of inputs and outputs you need, and so on. Make a careful list of what you need from an audio interface, compare against the ones that are available in your price range, and you'll be able to easily make your selection. If you have questions about these or any other audio interfaces or about anything we've talked about in this video, contact your Sweetwater sales engineer or start at Sweetwater.com. All right, well, that, that was actually pretty informative. I'm not, I got no real big, huge problems. I, I'd give you some warnings about clocks and I'd stay away from the Apogee and the UAD stuff if I were you. But um, I know plenty of people, plenty of my friends use that stuff and it works just fine for them. So who knows? All right.